Hello and welcome to Video Notes 4.2, where we're going to talk about uh, a similar idea of a hypothesis test uh, to last time, which was about a proportion for a population. Uh, but this time around, we're going to be looking at the mean of a population here. So um, you might recall that we uh, tried to model um, distribution, sampling distributions with a normal model if we have randomization, independence, and an approximately normal population with a known true population standard deviation that we represent with that sigma sub x right here. So if we know these things, then we can go great. Um, we can just come up with a, a standard deviation, or sorry, uh, come up with a, a sampling distribution um, that is approximately normal, that is centered at the same place the population is and has a standard deviation of this. This is uh, things you can find on your formula sheet, if you recall, on the second page. Uh, we had we looked at our prop, uh, population proportions last time, and so uh, you can see here what I'm talking about is just what's right here for our sampling distribution. Now, here's the thing, though, is that we don't actually usually know the population's standard deviation. So that's that third condition about it being, you know, approximately normal population with a known standard deviation. That's a problematic thing sometimes, a lot of the times here. Um, so what we do when we run into this scenario is, is that we end up going away from the normal model and talk instead about something called the T distribution, the student's T model. Um, and so you can read about its origins. We'll link to in our master documents, um, sort of a document about where this came from, if you were so interested in it. Um, and here are some examples uh, of that sort of thing going on here. So here we have in um, blue, that is our uh, normal model there. Red, red, that's the student's T model. So that red curve that you see right there, that is with a sample size of two and something called a degrees of freedom of one. Um, the next one there, still blue, is the uh, normal model. In red, that is one where we're dealing with a sample size of six, which means its degrees of freedom are five. Maybe you're recognizing a pattern with the degrees of freedom. And then lastly there, you can see that those two models, uh, the T and the normal model, are about similar to each other. That's uh, at a sample size of 30, which is a degrees of freedom of 29. So you might be looking at that and going like, wait a minute, that just looks like the normal distribution. Um, and pretty much, yeah, a T distribution is essentially a shorter, wider, normal distribution to adjust for the fact that you don't know the true standard deviation of the full population. So thus you have a little more uncertainty. Am I spelling uncertainty right? I am not. There we go. Uh, in our samples estimate of the true population standard deviation due to sampling variability. Um, and so you must push more of the data into the tails. That's the thing I always sort of remember is that the T distribution has slightly longer tails. So you can sort of see here the red, there's a little more area under the tails there than it is for the blue distributions, which are the normal distribution there, because there's just a little more uncertainty in all of that. Um, so the amount that you have to widen the curve by depends on how large your sample size is. Uh, we use something that we call the degrees of freedom, which are found by subtracting one from the sample size. So in other words, the degrees of freedom that we represent with DF is N minus one, where N is the sample size. All right, you'll notice in the pictures above and the applet demo that we worked with in class that the sample size increases, as it increases, oh, don't want to go too far, um, and thus our degree as a freedom are increasing as well with that, that the curve gets narrower and it gets taller and it gets closer to that standard normal distribution. 
So if we had actually a sample size of infinity, which would mean actually we have a infinite degrees of freedom, then it would actually become a perfect normal model. So in other words, we would end up using Z scores rather than T scores, uh, like we're going to be doing here in just a moment in order to find these out. Um, oh, use a Z star on the table, not Z interval. Ignore that part there. Okay. Um, so, so if we actually do know the true population's uh, standard deviation, we're actually still in the Z realm, okay? This is a special case. If we have a sample only, we don't know the population standard deviation, which is totally possible. Uh, think about, like, do we know actually the uh, standard deviation for um, the heights of every single person in Sunnyvale? No, we don't actually know that. Um, so... Um, we might have a, a large enough sample size that gives us a good idea, but we don't know it for sure. Um, so if we don't know the true population standard deviation for means, which is mostly always the case, uh, then you must estimate it based off a sample standard deviation. Okay, and remember a sample, we go with S, not a uh, capital, uh, not a, a sigma, a Greek letter, but a lowercase s there uh, that you've actually collected. So the sample that you've actually collected, you find its standard deviation, and we call that the standard error of the means, which we denote this way. The formula is s sub x is equal to, sorry, x bar, is equal to s sub x over the square root of n. So it's the same idea as with finding the... Um, standard error here as with if you do know the standard deviation of the whole population it's the same calculation take that standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size but here we're going to call it s because we're going to use the sample standard deviation rather than sigma which would be the whole population and that's again given to you so all in this row here we can see all this information is here if we know the standard deviation for the whole population great well, we can figure out our sampling distribution's standard deviation. But if we don't, then we just use the samples mean. So a lot of times we're over here. So here, we would be in Z land. Over here, we're in T land for all of this. So let's go ahead and continue along here. Let's use our new distribution and find the probability of a random group of 16 college students having an average grade above 75% if, a couple of different scenarios here. Their class of 197 students has an average score of 70% and a known standard deviation of 10% graded on a roughly normal curve. All right. We're not going to go through all the different conditions here, but it is important to just quickly verbally say them here. I'm not going to write them all down. So it says it's a random sample, randomization, great. Independence, yes, 16 is less than 10% of the 197, and it says that it's roughly normal. So we're good. So in this particular case, what do we know? Well, we know that the mean for our sampling distribution is going to be the same place as the mean of the whole population, which says is 70%. We'll call it 70. And the standard deviation for that is going to be the standard deviation of the known population, which they tell us we know, over the square root of our uh, sampling size, which in this particular case is going to be 10% over the square root of 16. And 10 over 4 is 2.5. Cool. So now we can move on to thinking about, well, what is the, uh, st st uh, the test statistic we want to find? Well, the test statistic in this case, since we know the samplings, uh, sorry, the, uh, oh boy, the standard deviation of the population, we're in Z land, as I noticed before, as I noted earlier. So we're going to go Z is, it's going to be X bar minus mu sub X bar over the standard deviation of our sampling distribution. So that's going to be, the sample's got an average score of 75, and that gets us a z-score of 2, 2.000. So in my 
quick little sketch of a uh, normal curve here. You know, if this is centered at zero, then two is over here. And so we're interested in how far away is that. So that's what we end, when end up finding. What's the probability that we end up with a z that is greater than or equal to two? And that's where our z-score table can come in handy here. So we're gonna go ahead and click over. We got our z-score table here. One more time over. And so two is right here. We're just gonna go with the first column. So that's 0.9772, okay? Oh, whoop. Uh, so 1 minus 0 0.9772, which gets us 0 0.0228. All right, so there you go. There's an example of where we would stay in the Z realm, the normal distribution, because it is given to us that the standard deviation of the population is 10%. Well, let's see how slight word changes can change sort of the process here. So in this case, uh, we're dealing with this class of uh, 197 still, but we don't know what the class's standard deviation is actually. But we do know that this group of 16 had a standard deviation of 10%. Okay, so how would we go about doing this? Well, first off, all the conditions still apply here, so that's good. What we do here is do the same process as before. What's our mean gonna be? Well, it's the same place that the population is centered at, that's 70. What's our standard deviation in this case? Well, since we don't know the standard deviation, oops, wrong notation, the standard deviation of our population, we're gonna use the samples standard deviation. So the same calculation, we're just gonna go ahead and use the samples standard deviation, which still gives us 2.5. Um, so this time around, we're going to find our test statistic, and it's not going to be a Z. It's going to be a T value here. And our notation here is we're going to put the degrees of freedom as a subscript there, so T sub 15, because remember, degrees of freedom are 1 minus our sample size. And so that's going to get us uh, same exact calculation as before, so observation minus mean all over the standard deviation, which gets us two. So again, drawing my little normal curve here, not a normal curve though, a T curve. Uh, and again, we're two standard deviations and we're still thinking about what's that shading out there. So probably gonna be kind of similar. Uh, let's go ahead and figure that out. So we wanna find the probability, oops of a t being greater than or equal to 2, t sub 15, I should say. So how are we going to figure this out? This is where our calculator can help us out. So let's head over there for a quick second. So let's see how we can figure out this probability from our calculator. So we're going to go to our distribution menu. If you don't remember, that is going to be uh, when we hit the second button, and then vars here, which is going to give us this distur, uh, menu here, distribution. And so this distribution that we're looking for here is using the student's T distribution. That's going to be the sixth one down here, T CDF, cumulative distribution function. So we're going to hit enter. If you've got the new software, it'll look like this, and you can enter your info. Uh, if you have the old software, you're going to have to plug in these numbers in this order uh, with commas separating each of them. If you have trouble with that, make sure you flag me down tomorrow uh, and when you're uh, uh, going over some problems. Um, so here we go. For this one, we wanted to figure out when um, our T has a T score of uh, two or higher. So two was our T score that we found there. And the upper is gonna be infinity, but we'll just plug in a bunch of nines to make it happen. Remember that DF is degrees of freedom. That is one minus the sample size. Since we're dealing with a sample size of 16, this will be a degrees of freedom of 15. And we'll hit paste. And you can see that it has that syntax that if you don't have the upgraded software, you'd have to have it here. So lower bound, upper bounds, and then degrees of freedom. And we're gonna hit enter. And there you have it. It gives us uh, 0 0.3197. We're gonna call that a 0 0.320.
All right, and so our calculator has given us that this is a probability of three zero point zero three two zero, which is a bit more than uh, the one we found over with the Z curve, which would make sense because we're dealing with something that has a slightly longer tail. If you sort of notice, as we pointed out earlier, that here the normal curve two standard deviations away has less area under it than the T distribution, the red curve there, has a bit more area under that tail. So that would make sense that in this case, there's a bit more of a probability um, coming out of all of that. So you have been given a T table, but it's not gonna help us with what we just did here. You'll notice I went to the calculator instead because um, we wanted to sort of figure out um, um, what was the probability? The T table that you have, uh, which helps us sort of, sorry, but uh, the T table has us uh, do something different here. What we wanted was the T score. Uh, that helps us identify how many standard errors a value is from the sampling distribution mean, so how many standard deviations away, but we're using the word standard error because we're dealing with the sample's standard deviation instead of the population's. Uh, so how many standard errors away are we from that center? Uh, and we needed to use the calculator to help us out there. Um, so yeah, so what do we use the t-table for? We'll get to that eventually. Um, so, oh, uh, I guess we should right here, use the t CDF command. Just like with normal CDF, you don't use normal PDF ever. We don't want to use TPDF either. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the backside now. We're going to try doing one of these problems uh, as best we can together here. Um, and then uh, I'll leave some of it up to you here uh, that you'll have to do on your own. So first, let us state, oh, let's read through this. A tire manufacturer is considering a redesigned tread pattern for its all-weather tires. Tests have indicated that these tires will provide better gas mileage and a longer tread life. The last remaining test is braking effectiveness. The company's current tire model allows a car traveling at 60 miles per hour to come to a complete stop with an average of 125 feet. Um, the company will now will only adopt the new tread pattern if there's strong evidence that uh, the, the um, sorry, that there's strong evidence that it improves the, upon that benchmark. In other words, we're gonna close, or uh, um, well, I guess we'll get to that in just a moment here. Based on the data from the 10 random stops given below, should the company adopt the new tread pattern, provide statistical evidence at um, a, uh, a, a evidence of an alpha level of 5%, 0 0.05, okay. So here is our data. Uh, what I want you to do is pause, enter that data into your uh, list in your calculator, L1 for me. All right, so what we're gonna do is first state. Remember, that's where we're gonna state our hypotheses, define variables. So in this particular case, we have our null hypothesis is that mu is equal to, well, if you reread the problem, what does it say? So mu is equal to, and I guess we could call it mu sub x, but whatever. We're only dealing with one thing right now. We're just going to call it 125. And then the alternative. What's the alternative going to be in this case? So if you reread, we want to improve upon the benchmark. That means we want to stop sooner than 125 feet. Okay. Um, and then we'll go ahead and define where mu is the mean stop distance for the new tires. All right, on to planning. What are we doing here? What is the actual test we're gonna be running here? This is what we refer to as a one sample t-test. One sample t-test. Why are we doing T instead of Z? Think about it for a quick moment. So the reason we're doing T is we do not know what is the standard deviation for the stop distances of these new tires. We don't know that, we just have a sample in front of us. So because of that, we're dealing with a T-test. Okay, 
We need to check conditions. It's the same conditions as before, which is randomization, independence, and approximately normal. I am not gonna go over this. I want you to think about it. Pause the video, write down how we know those three things are being met, especially that normal one. Really think hard about how you can check normality, okay? And then we'll talk about that in class if you're not able to figure it out. So with our conditions checked, okay, if you didn't quite figure them all out, let's continue along anyways. But with our conditions checked, let's go ahead and move on to the next piece here, which is to do. We're going to do some math. What are we doing? Well, we're going to identify the mean and standard error for our sampling distribution. So the mean for us is going to be the same place that the mean is for what we believe the population to be, 125. We believe 125 is the, the mean, feet, if we want to go with the units. Standard error. So in this particular case, we're going to take S and divide it by the square root of N. How do we figure out S? Well, this is where our calculator can help us out. If we go into the one variable stats movement of our test, we can come up with that it has a standard deviation of 2.7809. So if you go to your calculator and just run a one variable stats, um, you'll come up with that. That'll also be helpful for us in just a moment with some other stuff. Um, and that is over the square root of, they give us 10 things. So this gets us a standard error of 0.8794. So standard, or the mean is just where they say it's centered, or at least what our hypothesis believes is the center from the null hypothesis. And then our standard error, you just use the one variable stats from that list one to come up with what our S value is, 2.7809, and divide by that square root of our sample size. All right. So then what we want to do is we want to calculate our T-score here, our T-value. So... T sub are uh, degrees of freedom. What are our degrees of freedom? Since sample size is 10, we're degrees of freedom of 9. And so we're going to go with our X bar minus the mu over, sorry, over our standard error. Once again, from our one variable stats, when you found S earlier, it also gave you X bar, and that was 124.2 minus 125, that's our mean, over 0.8794, the standard error calculated above, which gets us a t-value of negative 0 0.9097. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just draw that t-distribution really quickly. Centered at zero, and we're talking about being, a, you know, here's negative one, so it would be like this. And we're going to the left, since we're dealing with uh, um, a alternative hypothesis of less than 125. Okay, so at this point, we want to now figure out what is the probability that our t sub 9 is less than or equal to negative 0 0.9097. Well... We jump over to the calculator to try to figure that out, and it tells us using our... I'll let you do it, actually, and then I'll write it down. So using your TCDF, hopefully you found that we have about 0 0.1933. Okay. So that's one way to do the do portion of all of this. Um, along uh, with sort of then our, our conclusion to be followed, obviously. But I'm going to pause for a moment and show you what does our calculator also do for us. It uses a TCDF function, which is great, and we really like showing this work. But your calculator can also do all of this test very quickly. Let me show you how to do that. So now we're going to go ahead and see how we can use the calculator to help us figure out our p-value for this test. Uh, quick recap of if you've forgotten how to find the mean and standard deviations of some data. I have all my stuff in list one um, right here, list one. 
So if I wanted to figure out what is the mean and standard deviation of this sample, I could go stats. I could click over to calc and that first one, one var stats. And it's gonna be list one. I don't want anything in my frequency list there, completely blank and I just hit calculate. So those were, I said X bar and S were these values uh, earlier in the video. These are them right now. So you can do this if you're gonna show all your work by hand, which is a good idea for a free response question. If it's multiple choice though, you might wanna to try to find your P value and things like that much more quickly. So how would you do that in this case? Well, in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to stat. And like we did with our pro, pro, um, proportions test last time, we're gonna to go to the tests column here and we're gonna go down to the, uh, oh, I missed it already, T test, number two right there. You can hit number two or arrow down and click it. There are two options for the input here. So it's on stats right now where I would just plug in what my um, null hypothesis mean is, what my data gives me for my things. Notice that it's already kind of giving me these because of the data that's already in list one. So it's already all there for us. Um, but if you're dealing with multiple lists, then you don't want to do this. So you can plug in the things that we found earlier by hand and plug it all in and hit calculate. Uh, but since they gave us data um, and we entered it already, I'm going to switch over to that menu, to data. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna change our null hypothesis. So the uh, mu null is gonna be 125 feet was what it was before. And then it just asks, where is your data? And I put it all into list one. So perfect. Frequency, one, don't change that. What's our alternative hypothesis? Our alternative is that we think that this could be a shorter stopping distance. So we're gonna go with the less than mu sub naught and then we're gonna go ahead and you can either hit calculate or you can hit draw. Remember, it doesn't really matter. I like the drawing, especially if I'm on a free response question, just to make sure that it looks like what I was expecting. So if I draw it out here, oh, I got a, an equation in there. We'll ignore that. Uh, but it's gonna go ahead and sketch for us a T distribution centered at zero. And there it is, all that shading right there. And so it gave me a T value of negative uh, nine point, sorry, 0 0.9097, which is uh, awfully, awfully close to what I found uh, to by hand. And then it gives me this p-value of uh, 0 0.1933, which is exactly what the TCDF function would do for it as well. So there you have it. So just to recap, you go to stat, you go to tests, and it's the second one down, t-test, and there's two options. You can either, if you have the data, like this problem had for us, we could do that. But sometimes it doesn't give you the data and it says just instead that, you know, your uh, null hypothesis mean is this. You grab a sample with this mean and this standard deviation and you sort of just work through it that way and plug it in that way, which we'll do in class. So you'll have a chance to work with that. All right, so our final step is to conclude. We had an alpha level set for 0 0.05. I think you can come up with your conclusion. We've done this a lot. So your responsibility is to finish the conclusion and come back and do your conditions. If you haven't done so already in the plan, at least try to come up with your conditions and why you know we will talk about both in class, the conditions and the conclusion.